with everyone with new friends and old friends. I see several folks here that I know personally, and it's a great to see you all. So today's presentation is about managing proposal teams powerfully, but I'm not going to be talking about the usual stuff. I'm hoping this presentation will give you lots of food for thought and this become a springboard for you to come up with new and innovative ways of inter interacting with your proposal teams. So let's get started. One of the best examples of managing a team powerfully is from my colleague, Ali Paskin, who's an, also an APMP fellow. She was managing a proposal that was due right after a four, a major four day weekend holiday. Normally, we all assume, well, there goes our holiday pants. That's our culture. Allie's goal was to get everyone to agree and honor the schedule so the whole team could take the Thanksgiving weekend off. By promoting that goal and working with her team's strengths, they got the proposal done and everyone got to enjoy their turkey dinner. So how did she do that? First, we're going to talk about what the main issues with leading proposal teams are. And I'm going to be talking about it from a totally fresh perspective for you, I hope. We're going to discuss why these issues come up, why we behave the way we do, and then how you can solve them. So normally we go, oh, they missed the deadline, they don't read the emails, they not, don't understand the RFP, they're not following instructions, et cetera, et cetera. Those are actually symptoms or the consequence of the main issues we have leading proposal teams. So I want you to grab a pen and paper or a note app or something that you can write with. And this is just for you, for your thoughts. You don't have to share it with anyone. And if you're uncomfortable using real names, feel free to make them up or use code words. The one person you had the easiest time working with on a proposal or project is, write down their name. Remember what that experience was like. Why do you think it was easy? Write down your thoughts. Were they easy to collaborate? Did you feel like a partner and respected? Did they understand the goal? Was it easy to collaborate with them? So write down your thoughts on why you think it was easy working with them. Now we don't work in a bubble. It's a two way street. So here's something for you to think about. Why did they think it was easy working with you? Did they feel listened to? Did you respect their point of view? Did they feel heard? Were they able to contribute in a powerful way? Write down your thoughts. And I recognize this may be a challenge because we tend to think about the problems and the issues. 
not when things go really well. Okay, so again, let's look at the other side of the coin. The one person you had the hardest time working with on a proposal or project was, and again, you don't have to use real names, you can make them up or use a code word that you'll remember later, and think about what that experience was like. Why do you think it was hard? Were you seen as a leader or a paper pusher? Did you feel respected? Was communication an issue? So note all the things why it was hard. As I said before, we don't operate in a vacuum. Why do they think it was hard working with you? Did they not feel heard? Do they feel they didn't get clear instructions? What were some of the reasons why they felt it was a challenging project? All the issues we have in managing proposal teams all boils down to how we emotionally react to each other, how we engage, and how we communicate. So why do we have these issues? Why is it easy to work with someone? And why is it suddenly hard to work with another person? It's all about how our brains work. The neocortex, which is the front lobe of our brain, is responsible for human language, abstract thought, imagination, and consciousness. The neocortex is flexible and has almost infinite learning abilities. When our neocortex is engaged, we are proactive and able to problem solve easily. This is when we collaborate the best. And when, if you practice mindfulness, this is the part of the brain that is the most active. The limbic brain records memories of behaviors that produced agreeable or disagreeable experiences. So it is responsible for emotions. The limbic system is the set of value judgments that we make, often unconsciously, that exert such a strong influence on our behavior. This is the part of our brain that is engaged when we react to music, a film, or a video clip that gives us the feels. It is also engaged when we have a negative reaction to a situation and it initiates the flight or flight response. We start to become reactive and start responding emotionally. It throws us into a stress response. By the way, we really don't understand all how the brain works. I first developed this presentation several years ago, and the science has discovered new things since then. So this graphic is actually wrong. <laughs> My apologies. It used to be thought that the brain stem controlled our heartbeat, rhythms, integration, and voluntary behavior. But in fact, Recent research shows it's the basal, basal ganglia, which is up in here. It has a key role in instrumental behavior. 
learn behavior that is modified by consequence. As Seth Goodwin says, it's all about how we're going to survive and how we're going to procreate. When we feel powerless, this is the part of the brain that becomes the conductor of our life. This part of our brain makes a subconscious decisions and takes over our responses. So we think when we're in the neocortex, when we're in the limbic system, we're feeling and being emotional. And as a result, then we move into the basal, the basal ganglia and start reacting instinctively. That's when we start having knee jerk reactions. And it can be instantaneous. These three parts of the brain do not operate independently of one another. They have established communication connections where they influence one another and your brain can move from one to another instantly. So you can be in a great conversation, really good collaboration, then someone says something that triggers a memory that maybe has a negative context. And the emotions of that memory starts influencing your behavior. And if it's a strong enough negative response, you can then start being highly reactive. So let's talk about some examples of how that happens. No. How do you feel when someone says no to you or gives you a negative response? How do you respond? Where in your body do you tense up? Think about that for a moment. For me, it's my shoulders. They start creeping towards my ears. And how does that feel? compared to when you're fully engaged, alive, and happy. So me shouting no at you is an example of how we can respond instantly and our mood can change. There's a wide variety of factors, most of which have nothing to do with the proposal and your team was working on that can cause us to lose our rhythm. Are they expected to be 100% billable and doing the proposal on top of it? Are you dealing or are they dealing with a difficult project or client? Juggling a lot of priorities. Those of us who work on multiple proposals at once understand that hassle. Some folks that we work with are the go-to person by executives to solve problems, so they're constantly being pulled into solving fires. And especially as we know from the last two years, family issues can greatly affect our performance and how we, we react in the business world. Whether it's aging parents, a newborn, a teenager, divorce, illness, a death in the family, or of a beloved pet, or even traveling a lot. Even road warriors can get stressed and overwhelmed if they travel too much. And also as these last two years and right now, there's a lot of stressors on us just emotionally. So we're often waking up just with a bad day emotionally. And all these stressors can cause us to be reactive instead of proactive. This leads to us taking things personally or your team taking what you say personally. And this happens a lot. Taking it personally increases stress, increases emotions. We stop listening. We start reacting instead of responding. We feel rejected. 
and efficiency is decreased. It is our lizard brain concerned about survival. I can tell I'm taking things personally. When I find myself reviewing a situation repeatedly in my head, I start thinking of other things I could have said. I feel angry, frustrated, and rejected. Once you recognize how you respond and react to stressors and negative responses, you can change the dynamic by simply taking five or 10 deep breaths, you can reset your response. If you've reacted unfairly, be honest with that person or your team. Apologize to them. It shows you respect them and it gives them permission to recognize when they're being a human being. And it engages a level of generosity as part of the team dynamic. When faced with someone acting emotionally, again, don't take what they say personally. And any of you who have dealt with a four-year-old know how to do this. Breathe and use a calm voice. Often your mood can influence them. Do not rush the conversation. Or if you cannot get them to calm down, table the conversation and set up a one-on-one -on -one so they can express their concerns fully. So all the issues we have as a proposal basically boils down to the fact that we're, healing, we're human beings and we're dealing with human beings. So how do we solve these issues? Of course, remember my antidote about the proposal due after a major holiday? Start with a project goal. Make it specific. For example, just don't say, we must win this proposal, say, our goal is to take this proposal, win this contract from our major competitor who is the incumbent. Or our goal is to keep this client. Make it specific. Then discuss how it affects the team if they don't win. There's often financial impacts to the companies we work with when we don't, when they have a low win rates. So talking about the win goals saying, hey, this will help every, the division meet their sales goals. And maybe we'll get better bonuses, et cetera, et cetera. A great way to do this is to create a team pledge that everyone signs. Then go over the important stuff, including schedule, Explain why it is important for each milestone to be met. Just don't give them the dates. Give them the explanation of the consequences of missed deadlines. Then lastly, go over assignments, etc. So it's all about building rapport, forming that emotional connection with your team that enrolls them in your goals. And in this case, when I say an emotional connection, I mean a positive one, where they have a good emotional response to you. Take the time to talk one-on-one -on -one with each team member, even if it is by phone or video chat or whatever. Why? A conversation can be an effective tool to build rapport. A great icebreaker when calling up your project manager or lead SME is to ask this question, what are you most proud of? Then listen to what they say. Don't think about the next question to ask. Don't think about what you have to do with the next half hour. Listen mindfully to what they say you can learn a lot. Use the flow of the conversation to define what questions to ask next. Simply by creating a dialogue with a team member, you can learn how they think and build respect and camaraderie. 
I remember creating a great working relationship with the project manager by asking if he had a moment to talk when I called him. And I actually listened for his answer, which was no. I then asked when would be a good time to call back. His response, thank you. No one has ever taken the time to ask me. They just start talking. He became my biggest champion. Another time I noticed a client project manager was Jewish. I made the point of wishing him happy Hanukkah. He valued that I noticed and took the time to acknowledge who he was. That simple courtesy totally changed our relationship. What are other ways you can build team synergy? Show respect to your team. By showing respect, you get respect back. As I said, and I'm going to keep repeating this, get to know your team members. It may take a couple of proposals if you work with them, you know, irregularly. But pay attention and listen. Active listening is so important. Your team is just as busy and sometimes even more than you are. So always thank them for their time. And a very powerful one is recognizing people who have hit their deadlines. Do it publicly during a status call or in a status email. That also has the added benefit of providing peer pressure to those who've not met their deadlines because they want to be seen in a positive light too. And Research shows that laughter and humor is a great way to lower you and your team's stress. So make it fun. Laugh, make jokes, be silly. So hopefully you're getting to know your team. How can you build on strengths? This next section is actually suggestions. It is not a definitive personality type. It is just a different way to look at your team and how they learn and work. And I hope this gives you some ideas on how you can work with your team to make things easier for everyone going forward. Delegators. Most of us, when we work on larger proposals or proposals that have multiple team uh, SMEs. We'll have a project manager, a technical manager who'll work with his, with his internal team to develop the technical content. As a result, they'll delegate portions of their sections to their team members. Provide your delegator with clear written instructions that they can forward to their team. That way, their team members understand what information you need, and understand the requirements more fully. They then will turn in the content to their manager who won't have to revise it significantly and you'll hopefully save time on edits and rewrites. So provide clear written instructions, but also as soon as you get the content back, review it immediately and send it back requesting revisions if it's not compliant. Don't wait until the review. Expressives. I'm a visual person. I don't sketch, but I take notes. Or I have someone show me the, a visual representation of what they're describing. For your team members who are visual, have them sketch out their ideas with you in a one-on-one -on -one session. Build an outline from that sketch. Then give them the outline to follow and include a graphic based on the sketch. This also gives you the added bonus of having an additional graphic, which we never have enough of. I actually learned this from a company I worked for where we used this process for quantifying the project approach to make sure everyone was on the same page. And as I said, use the sketch to create a graphic. 
I often have a person on my team who uses lists to organize their thoughts and manage the work. Think of them as someone who writes a haiku rather than a novel. Have them outline the steps for their section. Yes, Christina, you could call the sketch a wireframe. There's many different ways to, to call it. Thank you for that question. Um, back to analytics. These are people who follow outlines, list steps. So let them create the outline for you, for their section. Then use boilerplate to fill in the details. Then have them review and revise. Stress comes off them because they're not having, they're not struggling trying to answer the questions because that's not how they think. And you get content that's more compliant and effective. Detailers. I have a good friend who is an engineer. I became very frustrated with him because he could not answer a simple yes or no question. One day out of frustration, I asked him why. He told me that he could see multiple sides of the discussions all at once. He could see all the variables. It's what made him a great aerospace engineer, but hard to communicate with. For team members who are detailed and need to think the process through, don't give them page limits. Let them write out the whole thought. Then reorganize and paraphrase the section and have them review and revise. The other key thing with this, there may be content they provide you can use elsewhere where you need more information. Even more importantly, their content may identify a fault in the solution. Thinkers. I hate the word procrastinators. Because I'm sure folks thought I was one, but I don't think I am. Why? I used to drive my friends in college crazy because I would do lots of research, read lots of stuff, take notes, but not write anything down until the due date then write one draft and do some editing. I would then get an A or B plus. I still write that way today. I do my best when I let my subconscious do the writing for me and have a concrete deadline. So give your thinkers an early due date before you really need it. Remind them in a friendly way that the deadline is coming up and use peer pressure to keep them motivated. They'll give you your, their best work then. Driven. If we're lucky, we have someone on our team who reads the RFP and always deliver their material on time. Take advantage of that. Schedule their due dates to coincide with a lull in the schedule. Why? It keeps everyone in, sorry, I went too fast. It keeps everyone engaged and sees work being done. And it is a great reminder to the rest of your team, oh, I got to work on this. It also reduces your thumb twiddling stage. So you have more time on the back end for quality wordsmithing and client focus. So as I said, I hope these give you some ideas on how you can work with your team members. Again, these are not definitive personality types. I don't want you to think them are as, um, but as a way to think in a fresh way, how you can work with your team that's effective for them and you. The most important part, actually, of leading your team powerfully is taking ownership.
leadership is in action, not a position title. And we tend to forget that. So how do you lead your team powerfully? By taking a breath, stepping forward, and taking ownership. Remember, you are just as much a subject matter expert as any other member of your team. You may not understand how to build your product or the details of delivering services, but you are the expert on proposals. So acknowledge that. Remember the slide? This slide? How the cat is picturing himself as a lion? Think about that for a second. Acknowledge your personal power and knowledge. That feeling of being excited about being in this proposal industry and feeling alive and excited about the project. Create an image in your head of what that is. Then the next time you feel powerless, remember that feeling and shift to it. It's a great way to go from your limbic system to your neocortex. The power of your language greatly influences your team. So does your language empower you and your team or is it a roadblock? As Chris Brogan says, ownership has its own language. He says, you might say you're an owner, but do you speak like one? Or another way of thinking of it, as my colleague Means Davis says, the words we speak are what we step into. Think about that for a second. The words we speak are what we step into. What do I mean by that? I know there's been times I've gone, oh no, I've got to work with him or her again. Or I think this proposal is going to be such a bear. The results, the words I've said are what I've stepped into. The result is that's what happens. The proposal becomes difficult, stressful, and the results are not as good as I hoped. Now, when I receive a new project, I always take a moment to think about what I want the outcome to be. This is going to be fun. This is going to be a cool project. Or I'm going to turn this one into a great experience with Joe Smith. As I said, there are power in our words. Owners phrase things in a positive, sometimes competitive, and sometimes even aggressive way. We don't have to be nice, we're professionals. So show you are a professional by using words that show you own your choices and your actions, such as I intend to, I'm committed to, I choose not to. And that leads back, oh, yes. If you could see me right now, I would be gesturing just like this video clip. I'm moving my head, I'm gesturing my hands, I'm sitting forward in my chair. And this affects my voice tone and phrasing. Because remember, 80% of our communication is nonverbal. So, For example, right now, I'm sitting perfectly still. I'm not gesturing. I'm not moving. I've sat back in my chair. And have you noticed how my voice changes? As I said, your body language imports, impacts your voice. The phrasing, the energy of your tone. So get up move around, gesture, 
just like you were speaking to that person face to face, even if your camera is not on. Let's go back to the one now. Effective leaders use the word no up to a thousand times a day. Most of us have a negative response when we hear the word no or what we perceive as the equivalent. We also have a fear of saying no to others. In reality, the word is neutral and has no emotional context. When you decide this does not warrant my immediate attention, or this is counterproductive, we're not doing this, you embrace your intuition. Saying no is not the equivalent of flipping a giant metal finger. It shows instead that you have a vision, a plan, and an opinion. It shows you respect yourself. You have a right to refuse, but it's important to remember you are refusing the request, not the person. You are making a choice. You are respecting yourself and your goals. You are giving permission to others to say no to you. And there are effective ways of saying no. It can simply be, I'm sorry, that doesn't work for me. How about this? Or no, that doesn't work with our schedule for these reasons. Through the power of saying no, you give yourself authority. Saying no frees you to say yes to what is important. Occasionally, I like to watch TED Talks when I want inspiration. One talk that has stayed with me is Margaret Hefferman's presentation, Why It Is Time to Forget the Pecking Order at Work. One thing that really stood out for me was her discussion on helpfulness. I realized her talk applied to proposal and project teams. A good proposal manager takes the time to know their team and build bonds that take trust. Because a proposal is created in a true social environment. Your team, your relationship with them, your ability to build trust, all contribute to crafting a winning proposal. By remembering what really counts is what happens between you and each member of your team, you will indeed manage your team powerfully. Now, I can hear some of you say, well, all ideal is right for you is we don't have time to do all this stuff. I acknowledge that. But it only takes 30 seconds to create a connection with someone. It only takes a minute to recognize you're being reactive, take deep breaths, and move into your neocortex where you can be collaborative and proactive. And as for working with your team, that is a learning process. So at, you may work with people more than once over a year on different projects. So that is when you can take your experience and knowledge of how they work and start integrating that into your approach on the next proposal you do with them. Thank you all. I have references you are going to receive i have provided a pdf with embedded notes and all the links are live i hope you will check out these references and articles and videos if you're like me i always think of questions you know 30 minutes after the meeting so feel free to reach out to me at jeanette 
at winwiththeme.com. Remember, Jeanette has two N's, two T's. Or you can connect with me on LinkedIn and ask me questions through there. I really appreciate your time today. I know how busy you are, all are. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Jeanette. I think that was super powerful. I think this was a very profound presentation. I think uh, uh, many people, when you and when you said early on, take a piece of paper. Uh, for many of many of us, it would have been a shock to actually reflect uh, and type these things. Let me let me kick off the questions, and I'm sure uh, you know colleagues uh, who are appreciating in the chat box also steps in to ask some questions. Um, the the question that I have in mind, Jeanette, is. Um, you, you know, you started from the brain, how the brain reacts, and then gradually moved on into thinking, deciding, feeling, all the way into saying no and the power of language. What worked for you, Janet? I think taking time to know yourself and your team, is it, uh, is it better or is it recommended to, to have a blocked thinking time, regardless of what the big time scale is, so that we reflect on the bed? Uh, how do you think we should bring this into practice? It can be a wide variety of different ways to bring this into practice. The first step is with yourself. Mm. I know the biggest factor for me in stepping into a leadership role was learning not to take things personally. That totally changed my stress level, how I handled things. And I became much more effective and I started to be respected because I stopped being reactionary. Mm. I know several years ago, um, and I'm fortunately cannot remember her name, the uh, chair of APMP at Bid and Proposal Con mentioned that for her, the most powerful th uh, change in her career was learning to say no. Mm. So the first step actually is starting with ourselves, mm. taking ownership, recognizing how we communicate, how we can change that. And through that, we'll start seeing changes and improvement automatically. Because I said, we don't operate in a vacuum. When you start showing respect, you get respect. Um, ownership is an attitude, not a title. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Yeah, because as you said, you know, what is much easier for us to, to go from one proposal to the other proposal and we'll do yeah. that. Yes. But yeah. always, I, you know, I always tell people personally, what did you learn? Where did you document this? Yeah, the, the one thing I started doing was every morning I gave myself an hour on my calendar mm. to just review my work, where each project was. Um, and what I wanted to create for the day. Um, there's also recently something I, I heard, which I thought was wonderful, is in addition to having a to-do list, have a be list. Who do I want to be today? Mm -hmm. Or who do I want to be in this meeting? And that's another great way of doing this. Um, so I always start my day with an hour just reviewing where I am on all my projects and what is it I want to create, what needs to be done, and how can I be proactive in moving the project forward. And that really helps because it sets the mood, it sets my game plan, and uh, it, it helps me think about the proposal. Um, great question, Barbara. How do you subcontractors? That's a challenge, but again, it's the same thing. Treat them with respect and they're liable to get respect. Also make sure, don't rely on your team members to communicate to the subcontractors what is needed. Mm -hmm. Send a direct communication to your subcontractors of exactly what you need and by when. Um, um, I'll use what's a data call to do that with. Um, but also I can just be picking up the phone and saying, hey, just want to introduce myself. Um, 
peer pressure by saying no and keeping your schedule. One thing I refuse to do is I never move my review date unless there's an extension. My review date is the review date. It doesn't matter whether we have all the contract in. I'll put in the, you know, if something's missing, I'll put in that person's name in big, bold red letters and send it out. Um, that goes in the comment I made earlier about how our job is not to be a friend with everyone on the team. Mm -hmm. Our job is to be the leader. So sometimes you have to be tough. <laughs> and using when I said before about how um, in your status reports, or if you don't have status calls, just a daily status email. And you can do color coding in it saying like, kudos to Jane, Joe Smith for submitting these sub, you know, these sections in on time. These sections are still outstanding you know, Tom, Bob, Smith, and those, uh, you know, like the kudos would be like in blue or green and the outstanding or overdue items are in red. And, and then, you know, the stuff that's coming up would be in black afterwards. Um, that's another great way to enforce peer pressure. Yeah. But, and the, um, yeah, but it is hard with subcontractors because we often aren't allowed to touch them try and change that. Make sure that you are the one with the direct communication to the subcontractors. Uh, next question. I know there was another one here. Ah. Well, Hussein, I actually find managing a proposal with a team in different time zones um, not as challenging as you think because pretty well 90% of the world is now operating that way. Um, one thing that helps is to set up project office hours for times that everyone is available and make sure your meetings are scheduled during that time. Um, it may take some juggling. If I'm working with a team in Australia, I recognize that my day will shift to evening. It's that simple. Um, you do need to be mindful of your communication with an international team. Notice before when I gave that example of the four day weekend, holiday weekend, I recognize that today people are here from all around the world, not just the United States, North America. So I didn't use the term Thanksgiving. I simply said a four day, a major four day holiday. And every culture in every world and around the world has a major holiday like that. Um, so just be mindful of your communication and pay attention and be respectful. Um, you know, recognize the different holidays of, of your different team members um, or celebrations. Um, I hope that answered your question, Hesheen. Nicole. So, okay, how do you get people in position of power to comply who are used to people following their lead? Well, I found that with people in positions of power, that they respect, respect leaders. Um, and again, it's taking ownership. So what I've often do when I have an executive or even a president, um, if he's last, I'm saying, okay, you know, hey, Mr. Smith, everything is done except your section. I need it by this date. Otherwise, we will be reduced in quality and our win chances reduce. Um, so again, every time you say no, or ask, give a request, educate your team on the why. I hope that answers your question, Nicole. Thank you. Frank. At least gives you some ideas. 
You know, there is one other question on the top uh, from uh, Andrew. It's, it's similar. It's asked about how do you get the information you need for a, for a proposal from personnel like the engineers whose job is not to write proposals? I believe in giving a very detailed outline. A writer's, what I call a writer's draft. Some people call it a storyboard, but it's actually an actual narrative, an actual draft outline of the proposal. In it, I have the requirements. I had the valuation criteria at the top of each section. Then I take those to build the subparagraphs and say, you know, for example, if the requirement is describe uh, your security protocols, then I would write, actually start the paragraph with describe our security protocols on how we deliver ABC, include cloud, hardware, et cetera. I find by, in other words, it's about giving your team the tools to be effective. Um, not everyone is happy, right, is good at writing. So give them content that they can write. And I have no problem giving them boilerplate that I know has a good chance of being wrong because they love correcting you. <laughs> and it gets them to react and respond um, by editing sync, you know. Um, and again, that goes into understanding how your team works and giving them the tools to be effective. Perfect. That's very useful, Jeanette. I think uh, any last questions, please drop it while you drop the question. Let me officially move into the scribble quiz. As you know, anyone who comes out with the first answer is the winner, but points are also given to colleagues who try. So I have five questions this time. Um, so let me start with the very first question. Are we ready? So question number one, very early on when Janet was talking about brain, she mentioned one part of the brain is very active during mindfulness. Which part of the brain was that? Add the answers in the chat. Which part of brain is active during mindfulness. She told about three parts. <laughs> Terry, at least you try to. Um, let's give 10 seconds. Anybody want to try? That's close, Sudeep. Dark green, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Terry nailed it, but uh, was it dark green? <laughs> Good answer, Barbara. Yeah, well done, Barbara. <laughs> For the color. Yeah, pre prefrontal. And I think, you know, I think points given to Sudeep, Barbara, everybody pretty much who tried it, but the winner is Terry. So, next question. Um, um, hang on one second. Barbara, that shows that you're a visual learner. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Let's ask, this was a fun question. So while in the presentation, there was a clock, there were four time zones in the clock, four cities. Can anybody name what four cities was there in the clock? Four cities. Okay. Moscow, London, New York, correct. But there is one more. So deep you get you got pretty much three fourths. There's one more. It's close to Sydney, but it's not Sydney. Anybody want to try? <laughs> no. You are in you are in the time zone. It's Asia Pacific. <laughs> it's, it's not Australia. Okay, last try. Who wanna go? 
<laughs> Wellington. Good Krishna, I like your enthusiasm. It's Japan. Tokyo, hey, that's right. Ibrahim, you nailed it. The Sudeep and Ibrahim, you got that. So I know that was hard. So one of the words, when, when Janet was talking about power of language, she used a very powerful term, which is the words we speak is dot, 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 dot. What was that? The words we speak is dash. No. Oh, Marisa, that's brilliant. Emmy also, nice work. Yes, the words we speak is what we step into. There is one, one thing, one takeaway for me powerfully is that one. I think it's super important. So um, the, uh, there was, uh, again, uh, last question before we close, uh, which is one question that Janet said to build rapport to speak to somebody is ask them this question. What was that question? Either to a subject matter expert or to a client or to anybody. The question starts with what? What was that question? And you listen. Was it hard? What are you most? Wow, Nicole, legend. That's the top one. Well done, Nicole. So that's it. I think the second powerful message is, you know, any building, we had the same question in, in a young professional forum just two days ago, where somebody was working with the chief executive, part of the consulting firm, and they couldn't get any output from, from not just your team. The questions where today was around subject matter experts, you are managing partner, imagine you're a consultant, working with the founder director of some other company, how can you get him or her to write? Same challenge, this question would have been a blessing to her. What are you most proud of? Very powerful. So again, that, that concludes the, the Scribble Quest. Uh, we just close it here because we are slightly short with one minute. Uh, again, uh, to learn more about this presentation and this Janet's email ID, I'm gonna share it, note it down. We'll also send it part of the things. As I mentioned, 48 hours, we will send it. If you enjoyed this presentation, please like share in social media so that we could bring back Janet again for one more powerful session. But next week, we reveal uh, the Bacha Together leaderboard. Obviously, we have been doing it for 10 weeks now. We reveal who are the top 50 Scribble community members. Next week, it's not an official webinar. We, we decided not to go with that. But leaderboard, 24th March, we have Beyond Copy Editing, How to Edit Your Proposals to be Compliant, Compelling, and Responsive with Kelsey Ware. And 31st, we have Tara, Tara, who's here with us. Tara is going to talk about business to business, how to win with less time. All the workshops are available here. You know, you know, T, you can register here, but it's all here. But and I personally thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janet, for joining and sharing. Um, I'm sure you all enjoyed it. Thank you for all your appreciation. I will see you at the next webinar. Until then, stay healthy, stay happy.